and an exciting economic growth story. There has never been a more important time to be discussing Africa's next chapter. In the next five years, countries such as Ethiopia, Mozambique, Tanzania, Ghana will be among the 10 fastest growing economies in the world. And while the global demand for commodities is rising, the story is no longer just about resources. Our continent today has more middle income households than India, and two thirds of our billion people are under the age of 23. This demographic dividend and an emerging middle class are contributing to greater economic diversification and a trillion dollar market opportunity in consumer goods and services. These trends are fostering pan-Africa champions, from small entrepreneurs to Dangote Group and Oando of Nigeria, Equity Bank, Safaricom of Kenya, to Naspers, Sassel, MTN of South Africa. Our region has witnessed an explosion of homegrown business achievers. In addition, foreign investors, multinationals, whether from India, Europe, the US, China, are increasingly looking to the continent for growth as a major component of their global expansion strategies. This foreign direct investment to the continent is driving an important shift from traditional aid assistance to that of innovative new partnerships for development between public and private sectors. A great example of this has been the Forum's New Vision for Agri Agriculture Initiative, launched last year in Dar es Salaam, which has seen multinational business, local business, agencies such as USAID partner with the Tanzania government and smallholder farmers to catalyze investment and unlock Tanzania's agriculture pot uh, potential. Despite Africa's good news story, challenges remain. Leaders are facing increasingly complex global risks, including prolonged global financial market instability, commodity price volatility, particularly around food and fuel, and the very real effects of climate change. Domestic challenges include the need to foster better regional integration, catalyze investment into much needed large scale infrastructure, and address our energy deficit. And while many are moving into the higher income strata, millions still remain below the poverty line with inadequate access to healthcare, education, housing, and food. Critically, government and business together have a responsibility to ensure that Africa's future wealth creation translates into widespread inclusive development, particularly as it relates to empowering our youth. Ultimately, the success of Africa's next chapter will depend on the commitment of its leaders and partners, including the 900 of you gathered here today to promote strong social structures, stable political institutions, and an environment that supports our many diverse communities. At this critical juncture, our interactions over the next few days will explore in depth the opportunities, risks, and challenges facing the continent. And I am confident that this summit will be a useful platform for turning vision into action. On this note, Professor Schwab, I will ask you to introduce our six esteemed co-chairs and introduce our president, President Zuma, and officially start the 21st World Economic Forum on Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. Welcome, Mr. President. We are delighted to be back here after a very successful meeting, I have to thank you again, President Kikwete, in Tanzania last year. Actually, it's our 21st meeting, and it shows the partnership and the strong ties we have established with Africa. I have to thank not only our host country, 
But I have to thank particularly also you, the participants. If I look around here, I see so many friends who have been engaged into what we are doing with a lot of passion. And if the World Economic Forum is successful, it is particularly your engagement. What makes this meeting different is that it is not just based on sessions and networking and some fun. It's mainly based on the many task forces, which are year-long task forces, which try to be true catalysts for innovation. I would like to thank here particularly also our foundation board member, who is the heart of Africa inside the foundation board, um, Kofi Annan. Ladies and gentlemen, we are starting with a session which is entitled Africa's role in the new reality. And I want to have a real discussion. First, on the new reality. Everybody speaks about the world has changed. If I look back, by the way, when we were here, 2009, the last time, the mood was not the best one, just following the economic crisis. Now we are back, there's a lot of optimism. Everybody speaks about the new opportunities. <coughs> Everybody speaks about the new world. But what is this new reality? So in the first round of the discussions, we will look at the new reality. Not only, let's say, that we have a new geopolitical, geoeconomic context, with, by the way, South Africa playing a major role, and not only in the G20. I would like to, to congratulate you, Mr. President, because South Africa just uh, some weeks ago became member of the BRIC. Uh, and it's now the BRICS. And you may recall, you may recall practically in every session in the conclusion remark, concluding remarks I made, I said I cannot understand why South Africa is not part of those very group of promising emerging markets, the BRIC markets. Now you are, congratulations. And of course, when we speak about the new realities, we should not forget what's hap what has happened in North Africa. And I would say it's also a power shift. It's not just a geopolitical and geoeconomic power shift. It's a shift of power. It's an intergenerational power shift. It's a young generation becoming much more powerful. And how to tap into this resource? Because I feel it is what we can tap in is impatient idealism. I think there's a lot of idealism in this new generation. They want to be engaged, they want to be in the control of their own destiny, but they have to feel empowered, and they are very impatient, particularly impatient as far as bureaucracy, as far as corruption is concerned. And finally, I, I think we, there is also a new reality. The new reality is that we move from a fractionism which we have to a new form of cooperation between business, society, and of course governments. The World Economic Forum always incorporated this notion of being a multi-stakeholder community global community or regional community. I think it's a fact that those countries in the world perform best which have a common objective towards uh, which business, uh, political leaders and civil society leaders work in tandem in a community. And I think what you're doing, um, Mr. President, in the Vision 2025, reflects this, this idea of um, integrating everybody behind a great vision. But let me stop here. We will um, run this discussion in a hopefully very lively way without statements. 
um, based on, on notes. Um, and um, before I ask my first question, which will be, what is the new context? Um, and then having a second question, what is Africa's role in this new context? I would like to present to you the members of the panel. And of course, we have the great honor and pleasure to have the President of South Africa with us. Please give him a special greeting. <laughs> and then I would like to introduce uh, Peter Prabeck, Letmate, who is the chairman of the board of Nestle. And uh, here I uh, should also emphasize that he is, since many years, a member of the foundation board of the World Economic Forum. A special welcome to Tim Flynn, a strategic partner of the World Economic Forum, chairman of uh, KPMG International. Um, Mr. Empo Magmana, the chairman of ESCOM Holdings, one of the leading companies of South Africa. Um, Governor Mohole, uh, who is the governor of the Central Bank of the Bank of Botswana. Rachif Shah, who is the administrator of the US Agency for International Development, USAID. And I should mention here, he is a, a young global leader of the World Economic Forum. Uh, belonging to this distinguished group of people with extraordinary achievements uh, at the age of below 40. We always want to give a young dimension to what we are doing. And uh, finally, uh, Mr. Tinubu, also a young uh, global leader who is the group chief executive of uh, Oando um, coming from Nigeria. Now, my question to you first, Mr. President. What is the new context? How do you see the next new context of the world? Of the world? And by the way, I have asked each panelist not to be longer than three minutes. Um, but I think uh, you have a presidential exception. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Professor. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, well. I think the, the, the new context is that the world has developed, has become uh, a global village, perhaps more uh, <clears throat> realizable today than any other time that people used to talk about. Uh, you, you have something that happened not long time ago, the, the thing that you say when we met here, we were worried about the financial crisis, which I think indicated how much the world is changing. Firstly, the developed world where the problem began. Um, the fact that the developing world, the emerging economies, were in fact the ones that stopped <coughs> the, the deepening of the crisis. Um, which was a new thing, because in the past, if there was anything leading to recession, it would have happened in the old world, and the old world would fix it. But this time around, <clears throat> the emerging world were the ones that were able to stop it. And even now, reports indicate that uh, uh, Europe in particular, and North America, are going to take a bit of time to recover. And that development is very slow. And yet, the emerging <coughs> uh, economies are, in fact, moving faster. They are becoming dominant by their sheer size. Um, I think that indicates the changing world. The very emergence of new groupings, as you are referring to them right now, uh, which include, among others, the BRICS and IPSA, indicates the new voices that you can no longer ignore today, unlike before. And therefore, the manner in which the, the North and the South are related today is totally different. 
We are talking about Africa, which is being seen as an emerging region, developing very fast, uh, with a billion people coming into uh, <clears throat> the situation, a continent that in the recent past was a, a, a continent that came from a colonial past with a lot of difficulties. Changes that are taking place in Africa, uh, the democratic processes that are taking place, and indeed the, the manner in which the countries in the continent are handling their economy. And therefore, in the context of the changing world, that uh, the, the, the voices come from everywhere. In the past, it's not just uh, like in the past where the voices would have come from the developed world. Uh, and, and, and therefore, the developing world is beginning to say we need to be part, we need to play part in the decision making of the world. That is why uh, a very big debate about the need to change the multilateral institutions, um, particularly <clears throat> your, your, your UN, which is quite critical, as well as the financial institutions. Now, of course, the manner in which we relate is changing and being different. The question, of course, that to ask, what role or where is Africa here? I believe it is necessary now and very important that we need, as a continent, to develop very urgently uh, the kind of partnerships uh, with the world that are different from what they used to be in the past. The growth that must include Africa and the manner in which Africa relates to investors and how much we should have the relationship that benefits Africa more than it, it used to be in the past so that Africa becomes part of the process. Africa in itself has identified some of the critical issues it needs to do, particularly the infrastructure that must bring about connectivity in the continent so that we can be part of the world, but also be able to interact among ourselves. And, and therefore, we need to identify very specific kind of things that we need to do together. I think the NAPAD was one of the critical things that began to indicate how Africa must relate to the world. So that instead of going there to ask for aid, but we must discuss how do we do partnership. We must no longer be the continent that produces raw material and send it away. How do we benefit it? How do we utilize our wealth to benefit uh, the African countries themselves? So Africa as emerging with a very a big kind of uh, market uh, put together, uh, developing in its own way, how do we relate this to others? And I think we need to position ourselves from that point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. So the way is from cooperation to integration, even, even as far as Africa is concerned. Absolutely. Peter, what, what do you see as a new context? Well, I would say that I see this world turned around. I mean, if you think about the advanced economies, which are basically today in an enormous debt problem, uh, when you, which is a result, of course, of private and, and public indebtedness over the last couple of years, as a result of overpromising from the political sector uh, in view of an older generation. When you see those politicians today taking basically more and more state intervention, the private sector in defense, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a flood of over-regulations which are coming on top of them. And then you compare that with the emerging world, where you have a private sector-driven economic growth, which is, as President Zuma was saying, the one which helped us out of it. Isn't that Interesting that those who have been preaching that the private sector should be at the source of growth are today coming backwards and going backwards, state intervention, stimulus, uh, and so on. 
And those who have been told that they were too much, they have turned around and they are now the one who, is, who are on the winning side. So I, I mean, this is, quite, this is quite a change. Now, as I don't have the privilege of a president, let me jump over to the second part of it, <laughs> to stay within the three minutes. Uh, the second thing which is, for me, stunning is the food security issue. And it's only now coming through. The reality is that we have forecast this already two, three years ago. After more than 30 years of stable food prices, we are now moving into a, into a, a period, and long-term period, where food security is going to be in the forehead of our political and strategic thinking. And the reason for that is our very, very bad water management that we have in a global context. And the nexus that we this established by now between the food security, energy security, and the combining part, which is water. Those are perhaps two issues which I would say is a new reality. I, I just would, would add that, uh, Peter, you, you are leading a special effort in this respect, and uh, we hope to integrate uh, during this meeting South Africa as much as possible into this very um, substantial effort to address uh, this nexus you yeah. just mentioned. Now, uh, the next, um, Mr. Makwana, from an from a African point, again, uh, point of view, what is for you the new context? Thank you very much. I think that uh, what is clear, as has already been stated uh, by the President, is the fact that uh, there's consensus around Africa as a meaningful growth opportunity with opportunities that can be harvested at scale. You know, we used to, over the past, deal with Africa as a developmental case. Africa now is a sizable market, which, as has already been indicated, uh, of uh, currently estimated a GDP size of one trillion US dollars, estimated to have potential to grow to 2.4 trillion US dollars by 2020, 2025. And also what is emerging is that in the continent, there's a hundred million people that are evolving out of the low income segment into the middle income group. And therefore, again, corroborating the fact that there's a sizable market. That sizable market is also estimated to between now and 2020 to have the capacity to spend up to 1.4 trillion US dollars in terms of consumer spending power. The second thing that is clear is that we've learned throughout the world painful lessons that confirm that leadership is paramount, especially in terms of presiding over institutions that are strong, that are robust, and that indeed you need strong regulatory frameworks to sustain, as most uh, South African and most African markets have done so, uh, on the bedrock of strong regulatory frameworks. Lastly, we have a huge challenge on the continent that out of a population of one billion people, a mere 30% of Africans across the continent have access to energy. And therefore, moving forward, we're going to have to very quickly if the opportunities that we're saying exist are to be leveraged and harvested significantly, we're going to very quickly need to ensure that we invest significantly in infrastructure that ensures that you create that framework of integrated development. Rachif, from your perspective, I mean, you have a global perspective being the administrator of USAID um, is Africa still um, one of your priorities, or how do you see it? Well, for the Obama administration, from, a, from the development perspective, Africa is our top priority. And President Obama has crafted and uh, asked for a new approach to development in Africa that I think speaks to the realities that we've heard from others, including yourself, Klaus, and, and President Zuma. First, it's one that recognizes that growth is the underpinning of success and that we've seen 4.5% uh, 
continent-wide growth rate for the past decade, and we're optimistic that that can be even higher in the future as it lays the groundwork for sustained economic development. We've also seen uh, a real improvement in governance, and the quest for accountable governance, for democratic governance, the optimism around the dramatic political transitions that we're seeing in Northern Africa are all part of a movement around accountability and governance that really do underpin our new approach to development. In fact, President Obama invited 140 new champions to the White House and met with them for a few hours. And these were young entrepreneurs, change agents, uh, social entrepreneurs, people that had taken the quest for change into their own hands and built new innovative partnerships and strategies that achieved real results and encouraged them to continue on their way because this continent just has so much promise to stand taller and stronger on the global stage. For our part as an administration, we're trying to prioritize uh, the global agricultural challenge. And through a new partnership that we call Feed the Future, we've uh, targeted 20 countries, countries that have met the, their own conditions for increasing their commitment to agriculture, to nutrition, to addressing food security. We aspire to reach 18 million people and help them move out of poverty and hunger. Seven and a half million of them are children who today go to bed at night hungry and therefore suffer from stunting and a lack of effective brain development. But what's so different about this is what we're seeing at the World Economic Forum, that before it would have just been public sector entities and NGOs coming together to tackle this problem. Now it's driven by a new commercial reality with companies that are represented here in this room holding hands with President Kikwete and so many other leaders uh, around this continent to really make this a public-private partnership that generates real results. And that's, that's for us the new reality for a development strategy for Africa. It's one that prioritizes these new partnerships, channels the energy of young and new champions and entrepreneurs, and seeks to produce real clear results that we can report back to the rest of the world and demonstrate that this kind of tangible progress is not only realistic, but is necessary and achievable. Chubel, what is for you the new reality? Um, new rea reality uh, for me is effectively a new dawn for the continent, one in which uh, there's economic prosperity as a result of several factors. Uh, I'd like to, to say peace. Uh, peace has, a, has something which was not a big factor in Africa. It was regarded as a continent of conflict. So from Liberia to Sierra Leone to uh, Mozambique, Angola, it was always wars. Um, that's all I heard when I was growing up. And eventually, over the last 20, 30 years, you've seen peace occur as a result of a lot of eminent work that has been done by political leaders across the continent. And that peace, to a certain extent, was replaced by what I would call responsible political leadership, because we saw people come into power where they, where being in power was actually less important than providing a good, a good, um, what should I say, environment for the citizens they represented. So you had countries reforming politically, and according to the reform, they, they um, enabled, they created systems that enable transparency to occur, um, effectively creating um, systems like liberalization, privatization to enable the, the, the countries become a, a good destination for, for investment. Um, that in investment was not really one that was totally driven by foreign investment. It also saw the creation of a substantial amount of local entrepreneurs, all at different levels, medium, small, large. Um, and you saw the, the fact that jobs were created, um, and when the economic crash occurred in the rest of the world, all of a sudden, this culmination of 30 years of effort, if you ask me, was shown up in the fact that the continent started um, working as one should. Now, we, we must say that the challenges, still challenges across the world. I mean, the challenges in Cote d'Ivoire, for example, from the peace perspective, because I remember starting in the old business 15 years ago, and when Nigeria wouldn't get its act together, we used to go to Cote d'Ivoire next door to buy oil to supply to Nigeria that produced oil. And we've seen the reverse occur, where 
as political stability has kicked in, I will call responsible governance in Nigeria, then Cote d'Ivoire slipped into, into the crisis, thus causing um, what we see as strife. And without, once there's strife, there cannot be economic prosperity, there cannot be jobs created, there cannot be any attempt to improve healthcare or improve schooling. Everything grinds to a halt. Um, effectively, I see that as a new dawn for Africa, and that's um, what I think will drive the future as we, as we proceed along over the next um, couple of years. We heard um, the opinions of the panel concerning the new reality. I would like to stay with the new reality for a moment. Uh, there's one issue, Mr. President, you mentioned uh, the new geopolitical reality uh, with uh, the emerging countries um, playing a much bigger role on the global scene. But there's also another aspect. It is the changes in the supply chain, uh, uh, chains and the uh, shifts which we see in who is the most important exporter and importer if we look at Africa. And here, of course, we see the rise of uh, China. If I'm not um, mistaken, it has become the biggest client of Africa. Uh, is anybody in the, in the um, panel who would like to, 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 to speak about this point? Mr. President. <laughs> Well, if, if, if uh, <clears throat> maybe we're to talk about China, um, of course, uh, China, I, I don't think China is, is becoming uh, uh, the, the big exporter to Africa only, I think to, to, the, to the globe generally. Yeah. I think even the United States uh, is absorbing a lot of uh, <coughs> Chinese uh, exports. <coughs> but, but, but if we're to talk about, of course, Africa, Africa, as you know, has a particular history, a history that uh, it has related historically with the, with the old world. Um, and that relationship was very peculiar in its way because it was almost, uh, uh, in a sense, dominated by the colonial kind of approach. Um, and, and whatever, what was being done, <clears throat> that issue was always there. This is a former colony, this is a mother body, whatever. <clears throat> um, I think with, with, the, with the coming into being of, of China, seeking to have the relations, it comes from a different kind of angle. It doesn't have that psychological problem. Um, so it is saying, let us do business. What is critical, I think, that Africa must do? Africa must say, how do we interact with China in a manner that will benefit Africa so that it doesn't benefit one side only? This is what we, we for an example, take into consideration if you take South Africa as becoming a member of BRICS, that the issues that we could not discuss at that level between China or India or, or Russia, we can now discuss those issues differently as, as partners to say, if for an example you are coming to Africa, what is there for Africa? There is something is, which is there for China, but what is there for Africa? Instead of just looking at uh, China coming in and on its own terms and perhaps using the resources it has, mm -hmm. we are now having a possibility uh, in a platform where we could say African feelings about the relations in s whether you talk about South-South or China or yeah. India is very specific. We need beneficiation. We need the relationship, the trade that must benefit us as well. I think that, that's a new way of dealing with things in China. We are very much aware of the interaction, the size of China. The question is how do we utilize the size of China to benefit ourselves as the African continent? That's why I was saying earlier, we need to take a position that is clearly understood by us. How do we do trade with China? How do we utilize our huge friend, 
to benefit us as well as us benefiting them as well. So I think we need to have a different approach. Helped by the old experience, yeah. and, and, and South Africa, for an example, has signed a comprehensive agreement with China, which go into a lot of details, because you will appreciate uh, that people here, including the trade unions, have been complaining that there are these cheaper uh, goods that come to South Africa, they undermine the textile industry, etc. We are saying because of, of our relationship with China today, we are in a better position to debate those matters with China and say what best would benefit both countries. So we are looking at it from the African point of view differently, that our relationship with China, with the BRICS countries or IPSA, must benefit Africa as well. And coming back to your former point, of course, one billion people negotiating with 1.3 billion people uh, provides you with more weight compared to each individual country dealing with such a large entity as China is. But Rajiv, you had a point, um, and I've come back just to, to help uh, the panelists to prepare uh, themselves. Uh, two of the issues, if we, if we also feel they belong to the new reality, is the high volatility we see in the financial markets. Um, and we have here a governor of a central bank. We have someone from the financial community, so I may address this issue afterwards to you. Is it part of a new reality that we have this enormous vol volatility and we have to live with it? And of course, uh, Peter, uh, the volatility or spe speculation which we see in the commodity markets. And you um, are, were particularly exposed with uh, some of African products like cacao and uh, 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 coffee. So uh, I may ask you the question later. But first, Rajiv. Well, I just wanted to add on the new partnerships and as it pertains to potential programs and projects with China and any other new partner that nearly every panelist talked about the importance of partnership in addressing the challenges that we collectively face. And the new partnerships have some common characteristics uh, that define best practice. They are African-owned, African-led, it's African leaders and institutions that define the strategies and lead the implementation. They enable local entrepreneurs so that we unlock creativity and innovation in a broader group of people than we have traditionally done. Uh, they bring the public sector and the private sector together, and perhaps most importantly, they set clear goals and report on very specific results. You know, if for, for USAID and the US government, a model partnership for us is the President's Malaria Initiative. We've seen in 15 African countries where this program is working, a 30% reduction in the number of kids under the age of five who die because we efficiently distribute with a handful of African partners and local communities bed nets and better malaria treatments and other types of preventative strategies. But that kind of accountability and reporting on the accountability really does have to be a part of all partnerships with all countries. And I think, I think there are great opportunities to look at some of the larger Chinese investments and the projects that touch on development and explore how we can do a better job of making, that, making those transparent and accountable. Thank you. Let me, let me switch to volatility because um, it's so important that the future for entrepreneurs and business leaders is predictable. Now, we have this enormous volatility in the financial markets. Governor, will this stay with us? What do you mean? Is it part of the new reality? Thank you. First and foremost, uh, before I deal with the volatility in the financial and capital markets, I'd like to suggest that um, the new reality, so far as Africa is concerned, has several dimensions. I will confine myself to only three. Uh, globalization, the shift in demographies, and of course, the rapidly changing technological developments. The three are interrelated, as uh, you will hear in the next few seconds as I un unpack the three. Um, we will have witnessed, all of us, 
2008-2009 financial crisis, which culminated in the economic crisis, we were all able to monitor and receive developments almost real time. And this is a function of um, rapidly changing te technological developments. Secondly, in your best interests, we saw President Obama in his um, presidential elections make maximum use of technology. And we also were able to follow it up almost minute by minute. Something that we are currently witnessing is the social turmoil, as it were, in the Middle East and in North Africa. Uh, we are able to empathize, we are able to see what's happening on a minute by minute basis. Uh, and to me, it requires us, all of us in the globe, in this particular case, we are looking at Africa, to respond in a particular way. Now, it goes without saying that all of us, but primarily leadership, have to constantly adapt to this change in dynamics. They have to do so with maximum speed, while at the same time they are compassionate, they are accountable, they are transparent in pursuit of integrity. In the process, obviously, all of us, of working towards sustainable, inclusive economic growth. What do I mean by inclusive? Inclusive of women, in my best interest. Mm -hmm. Inclusive of the youth, inclusive of civil society. Last but not least, inclusive of the physically challenged. Now, let me turn to the volatility in the financial and capital markets. I want to believe that we are now beginning to witness an element of stability so far as the financial and capital markets are concerned. And to me, credit goes to the establishment of the G20 with its substructures, the Financial Stability Board, because now they are monitoring developments, are forcing us, those that have anything to do with financial sectors, to keep our eyes open and our ears open to what is happening in the world and to confine ourselves to new regulatory and supervisory uh, structures that are now coming into, into play. Uh, we were hearing earlier and commended South Africa for belonging to the, the BRICS. I have no doubt in my mind that the BRICS would also like want to do likewise. As a matter of fact, the BRICS were able to fare relatively well um, during the financial crisis. And therefore, I see no reason why we in Africa, now that we are represented through South Africa in the BRICS, should not continue to fare well and build on the sustainability that we're able to achieve at the time when the dominant um, financial and capital markets of the United States, Europe, and others elsewhere had to submit uh, to the reverberations of the financial and economic crisis. Thank you. Governor, I knew that you have something very special to say. That's the reason why I turn to you only now. Um, now, Tim, do, do you want to comment on the, on the uh, financial crisis? Of volatility? Yeah, I could. In terms of volatility and commodities, I think it's good for Africa. So I'm probably a bit contrary on that. I say this because we're a net exporter of commodities. We don't import commodities. So if agricultural goods, which is probably 40% of our GDP, is driven by issues of food security from the developed world, then it's a transfer of wealth into Africa. Um, if mineral wealth, which are natural resources, are driven by high prices, 90% of the gold is in Africa, 80% of platinum is here, 10% of the world's oil resources are in the continent, it's a good plus for the continent. It means we receive a transfer of wealth from the developed world, and we move from 3% 3, 3 or 4% of global GDP to a sizable maybe 7%, 6% over over the next 20 years. And the dream, of course, is to be have a couple of African countries to be in the top 20 economies by um, 2020 was what was hoped, but hopefully commodity prices may make us achieve that. Um, if that happens, the real issue would now be this transfer of wealth. Do we have the responsible policies of governance to enable us to reverse that transfer of wealth into infrastructure? Because it's infrastructure that helps you create an enabling environment 
of course, I mean, transparency, I assume transparency, good governance are given by this point in time, because right? you've already seen the political shift from an African perspective towards good governance. I mean, in the middle of this commodity boom, which, which, which we experienced, which everybody assumed to be the reason for the increase in the wealth of the nations, I mean, it accounted for probably about 25 percent, but most African nations reformed themselves when they actually made the most money they have done in the last 30 years. That's a very strange concept in Africa, and that's proof of, of, of the fact that there's something here to stay. Now, assuming you have the reforms haven't been, been sustained, there's a transfer, commodity prices, volatility supports our economies, and the money is invested in infrastructure, we will be a, a destination because we have a very large middle class. As, you, as we all know, 60% of our population is under the age of 21 and it's growing, probably the fastest growing middle class in the world exists on this continent. So effectively, it basically means that there will be um, 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 industries that can be created for local, the local environment. Because indeed, I mean, you made, you, you made a point regarding China. What is Africa going to get out of China? I think the challenge as well, too, is that we probably will end up exporting the jobs by simply exporting the raw materials without creating the infrastructure to transfer those raw materials to finished goods and accordingly keep the jobs in Africa as opposed to exporting those jobs a second time around. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim, let's, um, if you wait one second since we are now with commodities, um, Peter, um, what is your feeling? Is this part of the new reality? Is this enormous volatility and constant rise? I would rather say it's not only volatility, its rise of commodity yeah. prices. Yeah, I mean, let me talk about the agricultural one, which I know best. I think we have to clearly differentiate between the fundamentals, between the temporary impacts, and then the irritating, like I call them. Now, the fundamentals are very clear. The fundamentals is we have a growing population from 6.5 to 9 billion. That means every single second, two people more to be nourished, and 0 0.2 hectares of arable land less due to urbanization and to erosion. So that's, that's a fact, which has an enormous impact. Secondly, which has been mentioned several times here, the growing middle class. A middle class uh, means that people want to eat a little bit more than just a bowl of rice. And that was the 1 billion Africans, it was the 1.3 billion of Chinese and the 1.2.5 billion of Indian is just experiencing. For the first time, they have the possibility not only to have maize or rice, they also want to have a little bit of meat. And this has an enormous impact on agriculture because you need 10 times as much plant if you get the calorie from, from, from a meat set. So that is another factor. Third one is, that the agricultural productivity over the last couple of years has been declining and is growing less than population growth, which was not the case in the 20 years before. And the last one is a political decision, which is the unfortunate decision about biofuels. Because don't forget, today already, 15% of all maize production in the world goes into biofuel. 21.4% uh, of all sugar goes into biofuel, 45% of all rapeseed goes into biofuel, and if you would just make one simple political decision, no food for fuel, we would have immediately a reverse impact on the prices of agricultural raw material. Those, those are the fundamentals. Now add to those fundamentals some temporary aspects which we can and cannot influence. One is, yes, there were some floods, yes, there were some droughts, but they are, fun they are normally, they're happening, sometimes happening every 10 years, they were happening. The other things are, of course, wars and civil, and civil uh, up, uh, uproot, like, for example, the, the case in Ivory Coast uh, very clearly had an enormous impact on the cocoa prices, coffee prices. Those are temporary things which are coming and going. And the last one is what I call the, irrit the, the, the irritating, and this is speculation. You see, speculation irritates because what it does, it increases the volatility of the raw material prices. But when we believe that by regulating speculation, we will change the fundamentals, this is too short-sighted. 
And I think that's a very important message for the G20. Because what I hear is that mainly the thought is that if we can regulate speculation, we will have peace and there will be no fluctuation in the world. Forget about it. The fundamentals are very clearly here. In order to get the fundamentals right, there, there would be one fundamental political decision. No food for, for fuel. That's as simple as that. Mr. President, a, a, a message for the G20, because it will be very much uh, on the agenda of the G20, as we know. Uh, Tim, coming back to the financial situation, financial volatility as a um, part of the new reality. L let me first start by putting it in the context of, of the new reality and, and some thoughts around that. I was recently at a, uh, at a meeting of our young leaders and we had an outside presenter come talk and he started off his presentation with a quote from Lenin. And the quote was, sometimes decades passed and nothing happened. Sometimes week passed and decades happened. And if you think of the volume of change, the velocity and speed of change that happened around the world today, and look at all the shocks the system has absorbed, not in the last year, but just go through the last three or four months since our meeting in Davos. So all those shocks, the velocity of change, the speed of things that are happening, are causing risk and great opportunity and great challenges and, and a lot of complexity. So we're in a world of high velocity of change, high deal of complexity, high deal of risk and opportunity. Now, the financial markets, and I agree with the governor, that they have stabilized. If you look at all those shocks that have taken place in the last three or four months, the markets have held up pretty well. And, and yes, we have some challenges with the sovereign debt issues. We have challenges with developed country deficits, overspending, and those things have to be brought back into balance. But I'm optimistic that they will. I think the regulatory reforms will help. I think business leaders assessing and understanding risk better will help. I think having a better handle on complex financial instruments and understanding the risks that go with those, both from the financial sector world and from Main Street, will help. So, Klaus, I think that we are in a world of velocity, change, and with that comes volatility, not just for the financial sector, but for the world that we're in. And you see the transformation right before us of markets, the transformation of companies, the transformation of governments, societies, and of people's lives. And we need to make sure that we understand the risk look at the opportunities and move forward. And I'll just throw one other topic out that I think is part of the new reality, that I think developing countries and developed countries need to help find a solution. Because there's a great codependency from developing countries and developed countries today, and that's unemployment, in particular youth unemployment. Here in Africa, some 25%. In parts of European countries, higher than 40%. And in the developed countries as well, a challenge for us. And if we can't create the growth so we can share the economic wealth, we can share the prosperity of these great opportunities, then we're going to see a lot more volatility, I believe, in the long term. Mr. President, if I take up what was just mentioned, this increased volatility, um, the complexity, the interconnectivity, which creates the volatility, as you just said, it creates enormous entrepreneurial opportunities also uh, for those who think in entrepreneurial ways and take risks. Now, for the political system, isn't it overloading the political system, particularly as far as global governance is concerned? And don't we risk that the system which we have in place cannot cope anymore? with those global challenges. Would you like to respond to this maybe provocative question? <laughs> <coughs> well, I, I take it that if, if we take the matters that have been raised, for an example, the growth of the population <coughs> that uh, undermines, uh, in a sense, what is to be offered to the population, and I think the other speaker said that uh, you have, for an example, where we take food out of it, we do uh, we make um, <coughs> fewer, 
we also have the globalized world wherein the manner in which we take decisions with regard to the interests of specific countries, could do specific business. I think what I hear is a need to harmonize our decisions politically as well as economically. I think the contributions are saying you can no longer continue having certain decisions that are taken by certain people in business because of business interests, overlooking other realities. But also you can no longer take political decisions that overlook what is happening in other areas of life. But also the need to look globally, to globalize our thinking better, rather than to, at one point, to talk about globalization, but at another point, emphasize our national interests when we are faced with specific challenges. In BRICS, <clears throat> there are murmurings already with regard to the role played by the dollar. People are beginning to question, should we have one currency that determines the world? Is that the way to go? Or should we begin to look at other possibilities? I think that tells you how much we need to agree and harmonize what we do politically and economically. Also to look at the interests of the developing world and the developed world. Some of these uh, issues that I, I'm saying you, you lack uh, a very uh, important harmonization of the interests and therefore the decisions that we take, I think is to some degree exposed by the debate with the climate change. Mm -hmm. We cannot arrive at a final binding agreement. What holds that back? Are the interests that different regions, different countries have? I think the debate is calling for harmonization of our decisions, political and economically, so that we can therefore look at society moving in a particular direction. That we can no longer say because we either occupy particular positions and therefore we could take particular decisions. Let me just give you the current example. Here the Security Council takes a decision, a resolution, <clears throat> with regard to the airspace in Libya. But powerful countries take advantage of that. They go beyond that. They, they conduct bombardment. Now, weaker countries say, but what are you doing? They are being abused in a sense. Now, this is where we fail to harmonize the interests. We want peace, we want peaceful solutions of the problems. Those who are powerful are saying we can force peace, we can force resolutions of the problems. That's what I'm talking about, harmonizing our own decisions, our own resolutions with the interests of the globe, taking the interests of the globe to a, a certain level in, in a common kind of understanding and have common interests. And therefore, I'm saying the contribution is calling upon that the multilateral institutions that exist today must think differently. And therefore, the representation in them where the decisions are taken must change. I think that talks to that challenge. What you are saying, Mr. President, is that we have to act much more as global trustees and not what uh, Gordon Brown calls in his uh, last book, uh, to look um, for national solutions uh, confronting global problems. Um, and we haven't developed this, uh, let's say, community feeling, the global community feeling yet which we need in order to really uh, manage our common destiny. But let yes. me turn now to the second part of, the, uh, of our discussion. After having defined to a certain extent the context, let's see how can Africa, what, what are your concrete ideas, proposals, recommendations to make sure that Africa in this new context 
uh, is prospering and really concentrates, focuses on the opportunities which are provided with this, with this new context. And, Governor, I think you start now. Well, I don't mind beginning. Um, I, I believe that, um, and it's not the, the, the only um, the only step to take. I believe that we, we as Africa need to strengthen our initiative towards diversifying our economies. You will know that many of the uh, of African countries um, rely on a particular sector. Now, diversification, for instance, doesn't necessarily mean that you ignore the benefits of the dominant sector. It also means that since beggars can be choosers, you also have to diversify within that sector by way of beneficiation. Because if we ignore beneficiation in the way that we have, ignoring, we have been ignoring it, it goes without saying that we may not be in a position to attract uh, foreign direct investment in the same way that um, uh, the Big East, such as South Africa and Nigeria, to mention just two countries, are able to. Somehow, they are able to mount effective uh, roadshows to, to attract foreign direct investment. And it's for a good reason. South Africa, for instance, has um, an admirable infrastructure. If I was an investor, I think I would look to South Africa more than I would look to other countries. It also has the market. So if we are not able to succeed as much as we would like to be able to succeed in diversifying our economies, we should look to South Africa to diversify into our economies instead of if, uh, mounting roadshows to uh, further countries such as the United States of America, the Far East, and so on and so forth, because those entities have already established um, outfits in South Africa. The second thing that I want to believe we can do rather successfully is to build on the success that I believe we were able to uh, achieve during the financial crisis and economic recession, and that is build robust financial sectors. I did make reference to uh, the G20 and its Financial Stability Board. South Africa, for instance, is there. All of Africa other than South Africa is not represented. But we can use, we can make maximum use of South Africa's representation of the continent in the Financial Services Board. Similarly, I believe that we need to ensure that we avoid paying lip service to want to be represented where it matters in international fora. Uh, yesterday at one of the gatherings, I referred to the sad removal of Egypt from the chairmanship of the International Monetary and Financial uh, Committee. That's a very serious committee, so far as the business of the International Monetary Fund is concerned. That was the first time that Africa was represented at that helm, and we lost out because somehow economically in Africa, and in this particular case in Egypt, we were not satisfying um, all interested parties. And therefore, as soon as there was uh, a, a political turmoil in Egypt and the uh, change of regime, we had to lose out as Africa. So we should not just want to be represented. We, should, we have to live up to expectations such that we are not removed as quickly and swiftly as we did before we even got to know what the uh, contribution of Africa can be to such a key organ as the International Monetary and Financial Committee. By the way, I think I'm speaking to the converted. When I say that, that's where major decisions are made. By the time uh, governors of central banks and ministers of finance congregate in Washington, D.C., or wherever for the annual meetings, we are working on the path of the decisions that have already been made, not just by the IMFC, but also by the World Bank's Development Committee. So I thought I should just comment thus, that there's a lot that we can yeah. do, prepare ourselves infrastructurally so that we are not shaken very easily and removed from such important structures as the IMFC. Tim, your recommendations. Um, 
through? Just, just a couple of uh, high-level ones. I think, I think one, the whole issue of intercontinental trade across Africa countries and how they work closely together, take down barriers, and, and allow movement of goods and, and services across the continent, I think, is one opportunity for improving the economy and accelerating some of the growth. I think clearly addressing the unemployment issue in youth through innovation and driving entrepreneurship and really focusing that, having the proper capital support in place, having the proper governance in place, and, 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 and regulatory reforms to make it easier to do business in Africa and create business and start business are really important things for them to focus in and look at. And then finally, recognize the role that Africa will have on the global stage. We talked about the BRICS becoming BRICA, adding Africa to that, the G20 and the key issues, and, and live up to that responsibility and, and have a strong voice. Those are some things, I think, in the new reality that create, create tremendous opportunity for Africa. Mm -hmm. Makwana. I think that um, the first thing that we need to move swiftly into is to ensure that the average leader on the continent uh, sees the same things on the horizon uh, as far as what is our value proposition uh, to ourselves and to the rest of the world. Um, secondly, I think that um, we need to be constantly dealing with a very urgent matter. This urgent matter is that uh, in, um, out of the 54 states on the continent, only 20 states are responsible for 99% of the electricity and energy that is generated and consumed on the continent. And even within uh, those 20, there's huge disparities in terms of uh, energy installed versus size of population and therefore access to uh, a megawatt per kilowatt hour. Uh, for instance, the, the largest population on the continent uh, has about 10,000 megawatts of energy installed on their grid. Uh, a medium-sized country on the continent like South Africa with 49 million people has up to 41,000 megawatts uh, installed. So that is something that needs to happen urgently because if we are to sustain this opportunity, uh, this $2.4 uh, trillion opportunity in the next uh, decade or so, we need to ensure that it is based on solid investment in infrastructure. Thirdly, I think that uh, the business schools and other institutions of higher learning on the continent need to converge very quickly and ensure that we have a shared body of knowledge in terms of a repository of data that all of us can tap into so that we see these problems through the eyes of the same facts and data. In my view, gone are the days when you get to be deemed to be a leader based on how hard you can bang on the boardroom table. The best leaders amongst us must be those that lead us with uh, informed facts, figures, and data. Empo, I, I may uh, come back to one of the points, uh, energy. We released yesterday a report, as you may have seen, um, and I heard there was a discussion yesterday uh, which was very, uh, I would say, controversial particularly after what has happened in Japan. Uh, it's the future of nuclear energy in uh, Africa. Um, do you want to uh, express yourself about this issue? Certainly controversial indeed, Professor Schwab. But uh, from where we sit, uh, we have an integrated resources plan in our country that was approved by our government in March. And it continues to aspire to a situation where we do nuclear at scale. But we are not blind to the experiences in Japan. In fact, in our own organization, uh, ESCOM at the moment is the only nuclear operator of scale on the continent. Um, we are busy with uh, studies that ensure that we learn from the Japanese experience uh, so that when we do roll out, uh, future additions to capacity uh, uh, in terms of nuclear, that they are such informed. Let me also quickly say that uh, uh, as both ESCOM and country, we are very clear that we need to, uh, to rid our country and ourselves as ESCOM of the adage of being uh, coal junkies. Uh, at the moment, um, our energy mix is 85% coal. 
and it is aspiration that you will scale it down considerably uh, by up to 42% over the next uh, uh, number of years up to 2030. Yeah. And so we envisage a much more broader energy mix uh, that ensures that we're able to fulfill, as the President has already indicated, our climate change commitments and continue to be the leader that we should uh, be in terms of uh, a better future uh, that is both yeah. developmental but also cleaner as we move forward. What you, are, what you are saying also, implicating is that when we have this discussion on the nuclear issue, we tend to forget that the um, nuclear plants in Japan are 40 years old and today technology has uh, made quite some leaps. Uh, so we cannot compare here necessarily what, um, what has happened with, uh, let's say, the danger level of new, new installations. There's a, a robust uh, community of nuclear operators uh, housed under the World Association of Nuclear Operators. Yeah. Uh, every year we go through technical reviews um, and South African reviews always feature among the top three uh, in terms of best standards. I always say to colleagues that uh, we are saved by the fact that most of our staff don't speak French because uh, we will be finding lots of South Africans at Arriva and uh, you know, the, the other large French utilities. Yeah. Um, they speak with high admiration of the standards of South African nuclear, uh, and, and so we intend to maintain those. Congratulations. Um, now, Peter, what are your recommendations? Well, I would say, first of all, Africa should continue to uh, belief in its own strengths. And uh, I think um, it has been moving away from a uh, donor-led development uh, where they were looking outside how much aid I'm going to get in order to develop myself to a recipient-led uh, development. And I think this has proven to be much more efficient than the donor aid uh, thing. So I think this is the first recommendation, continue in this, in this uh, way and not, and not backwards. We made a study of the 35 uh, fastest growing African states, and interesting enough, the aid, foreign aid, diminished over the last five years from 3.2% to 2.5% of GDP. The 15 slowest growing, the laggards of the African uh, uh, states, they increased foreign aid in the same period from 6% to 9%, which is a clear indication that just relying on foreign aid is not going to be the future of, of, of Africa. That's one thing. The second thing is I think Africa has to assure that it is capable to receive investments. We all understand, and the President was pointing it out very clearly, that Africa needs infrastructure. But I was saying just in a session before, you know, to build a railway from the east to the west and just to build it with foreign workers, and then afterwards not to have the engineers, the machinists who can really keep this thing going, it's not a good investment. It's only a good investment when with the infrastructure comes the transfer of know-how, of technology, it comes the, towards the, the local uh, workforce. So it's extremely important that the educational preparation in Africa continues to be stressed and continues to be developed as fast as possible. I think, for example, the German uh, apprenticeship could be a good example in order to assure that you don't have only university degrees, that you also have good mechanics, to electricians, and things like that. So that would be the other one. And the last one is we should never forget that the extreme poverty is everywhere in the world, including in Africa, it is concentrated in the rural uh, population. 80% of extreme poverty in the world is in the rural area, not in the cities. Therefore, the rural development becomes extremely important. And to the rural development belongs such simple things like, for example, property rights. Uh, we have in Africa still an inherent gender inequality, which itself reflects very strongly 
uh, at the farm level, for example, that women don't have the same rights for property than men and things like this. So I think I would put a lot of emphasis in order to have a stronger rural development plan. Chuban? Yeah, well, for me, um, I think that the, the social, uh, political, economic, quiet revolution we've seen that has caused us to say that without a doubt there's a new dawn for the continent as we experience it needs to be sustained because so often it's good to um, pat ourselves on the back and say we've done a good job when we've only just simply started the, the beginning of the marathon. I think clearly it's so easy to slip back into conflict uh, like we've seen um, in Cote d'Ivoire and even in nations like Egypt, Morocco who technically have substantially more GDP per capita than the rest of Africa, they've been able to slip, slip into social strife as a result of a, of a failure to ensure that there is um, social participation. In other words, the economy, the, the prosperity spreads across all sides, and that deals with extreme poverty on one end all the way to the, to, to the middle and to the, to the top. I think that's critical. Um, there's no doubt that also as the emergence of the, of the, of the economic success as we see it, Saving is also very important, uh, particularly for the rainy day. Um, commodity prices are only interesting when they're, when they're fluctuating higher. That's when the Western world gets interested. When they're fluctuating at, at sub-zero levels or very close, like we've experienced, we've seen oil at $10 a barrel where economies couldn't even, make, couldn't even pay their basic salaries. It's happened in the last 20 years, and it will happen. Gold is at its highest. It will, it will reverse, and we need to be ready for when that happens. And the only way of doing that is by ensuring there's an enabling environment which has been created by an investment in this good times into infrastructure to ensure that jobs can be created. We often, we often talk about the creation of jobs, but jobs don't really get created. They get, it's a direct result of doing things properly. If you, like what we call in our business as key performance indicators, if you invest at the right time when prices are high, um, review, improve the quality of the workforce, for example, then the jobs will be created because as a direct result of the actions you've taken, there will be prosperity, and that's where it comes in. Um, finally, I think that there's no doubt that investment in, um, to, 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 in, in social, other social amenities like healthcare and education is critical. I mean, one of the big factors that we're, I think we're facing a death of in Africa today is the import of skilled labor. Um, we've seen at managerial level a lot of technocrats and very well-trained indigenous Africans. We call them repatriates where we come from. We, we hire a good chunk of, Niger of, of Nigerians and other Africans who've done very well in the international community, and they come back to run the businesses which we, we're expanding on. Our government has done the same thing. We have ex-World Bank uh, uh, vice presidents, ex-World Bank managers, ex-ADB people in very serious positions in our government today, and the difference is clear in the mentality as we save for the future. For example, they sponsored recent legislation to ensure that any amount of money over and above the budgeted amount would not result in deficit spending, but will be saved in a sovereign wealth fund for the future, for example. But I think that whilst we've achieved that at the higher levels of society, um, in terms of simple, um, quality technical capacity. I'm not, I'm not looking for PhDs or anything. We've done badly in terms of investing in skills. And as you rightly said earlier on, the railways will be, will be built, but the question is, will the skills be transferred? So that's a big aspect, because we're seeing a lot of projects where, for example, um, in West Africa, a lot of Indian engineers are coming in, substantial numbers, because there's just a lack of technical capacity to, to ensure the thing. So education, and certainly health as a population, um, um, as the prosperity continues with my contributions. Thank you. Rachef? Well, you know, one, one concept that we haven't talked as much about on the panel that, that we believe is very much a part of the immediate and medium-term future is the role of technology. And if you think about over the past 10 or 15 years, many of the biggest developmental gains in Africa have been tied to specific inventions of new technologies and new business models. I think the most powerful breakthrough has been the mobile phone and the businesses that promulgated that uh, across the continent in a very deep and profound way. That net then lays the platform for mobile banking systems, for health systems that communicate via mobile text messaging to, uh, to communities throughout rural sub-Saharan Africa. In the same way, we can look across so many of the different areas that the development partners and communities have focused on. 
a microbicide that empowers women to protect themselves, as they are now inventing here in South Africa, has the potential to turn the tide on HIV in a way that almost no other intervention would. A new vaccine for malaria could literally eliminate or even eradicate that disease and is perhaps only a few years off. New agricultural technologies can improve performance in low rainfall settings and again, in, with partnerships, uh, global partnerships that bring private inventors to the table, we're not that far from having those big breakthroughs. And so there's a way to envision the future here that unlocks a lot of the power of that technology to literally bend the curve of progress in all of these different sectors. And that's something we're pushing ourselves to think much more about at USAID. Before the President uh, Zuma has the last word, I, I just would like to thank you for having taken on the co-chairmanship of uh, this session. And we will have a panel with the co-chairs uh, on Friday at the end of um, this meeting again. And we have heard many proposals, many ideas. We have defined the new context. But what we will discuss in, so the, in um, our final session on Friday is the how. We will concentrate on the how during the sessions over the next 36 hours. And then I would like to have you back and to report from you, your side, uh, how do we do it really? But now, President Zuma. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I think a very useful points have been made as, as suggestions. Of course, as, as you started by asking what, what is the world like and where Africa is, and I think we're focusing on the African continent, <clears throat> clearly uh, Africa has shifted to a large extent in terms of the leadership that you have in Africa today, and the focus on specific issues. I think today you, you can no longer talk about uh, the old Africa. <clears throat> talk about the new Africa that is looking at these issues very seriously. It is clear that uh, we need, uh, from the African point of view, to really find our position, how do we relate to the world? And we have talked a lot about it in the course of the discussions. But I think we need also to say, how do we interact among ourselves in the continent? There's a very little uh, intra-Africa trade, which is important in the changing world itself. That's the emphasis that has been identified by the leaders in the continent of focusing on the infrastructure so that you create the intertrade, the interconnection, which is lacking. It has its own uh, reasons, because those are historic reasons. But I think there's a realization that we need to do so. Africa decided to develop in terms of regions and these regions that are gradually strengthening themselves will be having a summit here in South Africa very shortly, where in SADC, Comesa, and East African community will be meeting in an attempt to broaden our economic activities. And I'm sure we needed to see similar kind of activities in other regions so that we are in a better position uh, to face the, the changed world. Um, I think some of the issues that have been raised are very important, the issue of peace and stability, which Africa has focused on quite uh, strongly. I'm sure we wish that uh, if, if only we were assisted uh, on this question uh, by countries outside of Africa to help us uh, to establish more peace and stability instead of uh, <clears throat> participating in provoking some trouble somewhere. I, I think it is uh, very important that uh, there is stability. 
But of course, one of the critical issues that I think has been touched again on the discussions is the question of skills and education in the continent. Because even if we talk about creating jobs, if you have a greater uh, population that is not skilled, then you remain with a bigger problem. Uh, that's why, in terms of South Africa, we have emphasized and identified education as an apex priority in the country. We have also identified rural development as a critical uh, priority so that we can then address the question of the rural areas, which are always uh, uh, lagging behind. I believe that uh, the, the, the African continent has to look at its agenda, for an example, when we go to the AU summit. What are the issues that we discuss in the AU summit? Do we, do we come to make uh, generally the country statements, uh, or do we come to look at the economic challenges that face the continent and begin to say, what are our experts thinking, the African experts, on economic issues, for an example? What are the proposals that they are putting forward? Uh, what is it that we can do? There should be more activities economically, I think, in the continent than there have been. Uh, we, we talk, for an example, of the lack of skills in the continent. The reality is that there are quite a good percentage of the African uh, intelligentsia that is all over the world. Because in the continent, there are no conditions for them to work. We have not done things in a sense that it could attract them back to the continent. So I think that's what we also uh, need to do so that we are able to relate uh, to the global changes. If we say Africa is a, uh, one of the fast growing regions and it has the billion people, I think we should think differently than we've been thinking. Uh, Firstly, as I said, the manner in which we interact among ourselves, but also how do we interact with the world. But we should be assisted from that point of view. We should develop a common approach to the problems of the continent. I think we could go very far if uh, we have a common, a common approach um, as, as the continent of Africa. But I, I, I've taken the the, the discussions to be very useful. I think there's been very useful contributions that have been made. Um, we, 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 I think that uh, uh, we, we have noted some of the issues that have been made, certainly. Uh, we will be taking forward and my colleagues here who are sitting here, um, presidents and uh, prime ministers <laughs> and deputy prime ministers who are here. Uh, should I mention the countries? <laughs> from uh, Gabon, Tanzania, uh, you know, our good neighbor, <laughs> Zimbabwe. <laughs> so I'm sure they, they, they've, been, they've been listening and I'm sure they're participating also in other, in other uh, uh, sessions. Uh, certainly, uh, the fact that you have uh, this kind of interaction in the continent of Africa is very useful because it gives us an opportunity really to interact on the issues and the thinking that uh, the, the world is, is, is having and, and how we should be looking at things. Thank you very much for the good session indeed. Thank you. Chris. We will have uh, the honor to listen to the participating presidents, prime ministers in other uh, sessions, uh, but I would also recognize um, with great pleasure your participation. I think this dialogue which we have here is very important, but it doesn't integrate only politicians and uh, business leaders. I think it's very important today to integrate all stakeholders of global society. And so there's one group of stakeholders which is particularly dear to myself and uh, my wife, I should say, uh, so social entrepreneurs, so drivers in many villages and so on of social innovation and change. 
and uh, it has become a tradition at the opening sessions of um, our regional summits to honor the best role models of social entrepreneurship. And I may ask Hilde uh, to uh, present to us the social entrepreneurs of the year from Africa. President Zuma, distinguished heads of state and heads of governments, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm delighted to present the winners of the Social Entrepreneur Award for Africa 2011 at this 21st World Economic Forum on Africa. During this meeting, we have heard and we will still hear much about entrepreneurship as a key for Africa's next chapter of growth. We will also hear about the need to address critical social challenges faced by the continent. Social entrepreneurs are individuals who do both. They create enterprises which confront pressing social problems with an innovative, pragmatic approach. They use business methods, but without looking for personal gain to ensure their long-term financial sustainability. Their primary goal is to maximize benefits for society and the environment. Since the creation of this award in 2005, we have seen worldwide a steady increase of applications by outstanding people who work in all sectors of development, be it in health, education, technology, the environment. We are delighted to include these individuals in our network, but above all in the activities of the World Economic Forum and give them a platform like this one at our regional meetings throughout the world. Out of more than 100 applications from across the continent, we have now three winners to present to you today. Our first distinguished social entrepreneur is Olivia van Rooyen. She's the founder and executive director of the Kuyasa Fund. She is the winner of the Social Entrepreneur Award in South Africa in 2010. Nearly 1.1 billion people around the world live in deficient homes. When Olivia van Rooyen started the Kuyasa Fund in 1999, she understood the importance of improving the quality of housing for the poor. Decent housing helps develop closely knit communities where children can attend school regularly and where crime decreases. The Kuyasa Microfinance Fund was especially created for housing projects and provides services to families who own land titles but have not had access to loans or banking services. Since the year 2000, Kuyasa has granted over 10,000 loans and improved nearly 52,000 houses. Olivia, please come up on stage. <laughs> Aleki Dondo is founder and managing director of Chuhidi Kilimo in Kenya. In sub-Saharan Africa, 60 to 75% of people are employed in agriculture. Most of them are small-scale subsistence farmers with little access to bank loans or technical training. Chuhudi Kilimo provides financing to over 7,500 smallholder farmers, roughly half of which are women. Prior to dispersing the loan, Chuhudi provides borrowers six months of training in financial literacy and in animal husbandry. The average income of its clients doubles or triples as a result of their loan. Aliki Dondo is considered a pioneer of microfinance in sub-Saharan Africa. He realized that bringing people out of poverty must go beyond income creation. It must help families safeguard against unexpected risks as well. So his organization offers borrowers also insurance on their loans so that they and that they and their family cannot be further indebted. Aleke, would you please come up? <laughs> G. 
Juliana Rotic, created the organization Ushahidi. Juliana was in Western Kenya in 2008 when the election violence broke out. She found it near impossible to get accurate and timely information about the violence. It was then that Ushaidi was born. In the meantime, its reach is worldwide. Ushaidi is a global technology platform that aggregates data from text messages, Twitter, and other means. It then visually maps the data for others to use. Ushaidi is active in many ways. It has verified election results across Brazil, it tracks teacher absenteeism in Uganda. It has facilitated market efficiency through mapping prices and production of goods across six countries in Africa. And it has helped aid workers in Haiti and Japan reach those affected by the natural disasters. Ushaidi shows that new technologies, when used in an innovative way, can strengthen democracy and economic development. Juliana, please. Please join me in thanking these wonderful individuals for everything they do for humanity. We, 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 we will take a group photo now with the Social Entrepreneurs of the Year. I should mention, Hilda, so there's a fourth Social Entrepreneur of the year who African who could not join us and whom we will honor next year on the occasion of the opening uh, of the World Economic Forum in Africa 2012. Um, so again, great thanks to the panelists, to you, particularly President Zuma, and I should add congratulations to the social entrepreneurs. And please join us all for a good. Question.